Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening, I'm Yvonne Staff for Science for the Public and I welcome you to tonight's Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Our subject is quantum computing and quantum biology and our distinguished guest is Seth Lloyd, one of the pioneers in quantum computation. Seth Lloyd is the Nam P. Su Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In addition, he is Principal Investigator at the MIT Research Laboratory of Electronics and Director of the Center for Extreme Quantum Information Theory, XQIT, at MIT. He's also an adjunct professor at Santa Fe Institute and is on the editorial board of Quantum Information Processing. Dr. Lloyd was already an emerging star in quantum computation before he received his PhD in theoretical physics from Rockefeller University in 1988. He went on to Caltech to work with Nobel laureate Murray Gell-Mann, where he developed the first viable design for a quantum computer and the first demonstration of quantum algorithms. When Dr. Lloyd joined the faculty at MIT in 1994, he was an established leader in the development of quantum computation, physics of information, and complex systems. More recently, he's made an important contribution to the emerging field of quantum biology as well. In addition to his contribution to and awards for quantum computation, Dr. Lloyd has been an educational innovator, training the next generation of MIT geniuses. And he's also written a book for the general public, Programming the Universe, in which he outlines his concept of the universe as a co quantum computer. He'll discuss all of this tonight. It's a great pleasure and an honor to welcome Dr. Seth Lloyd. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Yvonne. It's great to be here. Okay, I have to start with computation just generally, please. Could you help us out here with the difference between digital computers that we use now and quantum computers? What's the difference? So digital computers, of which almost everybody has a very powerful one, even in their smartphone, yeah. are very common. And they process lots and lots of information for us. And the way they process information is they chop up that information into tiny pieces called bits. Now a bit <clears throat> is just the distinction between two possibilities, yes or no, zero or one, yeah. true or false. And an, in a conventional digital computer, this bit is represented in physically by having a little capacitor, a kind of bucket for electrons, be either full or empty, charged or uncharged. So bucket empty is zero, Bucket full is one. <clears throat> and when you flip a bit, for instance, if you take full, you empty it. You right. empty the bucket. So you switch zero to one. And all of the fancy things that ordinary classical computers do simply involves flipping bits in a systematic way. Now, quantum computers are also computers. And they process information. And they chop up the information into very tiny pieces. Um, and they flip bits. But the difference is that the bits in a quantum computer are represented at the most tiny level. Mm -hmm. So at the very smallest level, you could have, say, rather than having a whole bucket full of electrons representing a one, you could have a single electron here representing a one. Or you could have an electron there representing a zero. Mm -hmm. um, so far, it's just like a classical bit. If mm -hmm. the electron moves from here to there, then you've changed a one into a zero, or you've flipped a bit. But now the kind of quantum funkiness comes in. Sorry, funkiness is a technical term. Here, oh, right, right. thank yeah. you. <laughs> Glad to know, I was worried. Yeah, James Brown, once he was at a concert, somebody asked him, James, what are you gonna play next? And he said, I don't know, but whatever it is, it's got to be funky. <laughs> so quantum mechanics is kind of the James Brown of I science, see. okay? So um, the central funkiness of quantum mechanics comes because 
particles like electrons have waves that are associated with them. So wave over here mm -hmm. means electron pretty much over here. Wave over there means electron pretty much over there. But it's totally okay for an electron to have a wave which is here and mm -hmm. there at mm -hmm. the same time. This means that this single electron is both over here and there simultaneously, mm -hmm. which means considered as a bit, it's a quantum bit mm -hmm. or qubit mm -hmm. that is in some funky quantum sense that nobody really understands, registering both zero and one simultaneously. It's weird, it's strange, I don't understand it, I don't know anybody who does, but that's the way it is. But it's fast and it's mighty, is that the idea? Well, quantum computers don't get their power so much from being faster though, than classical computers, though they could be much faster. I see. Um, it's really from this quantum weirdness, this quantum funkiness. So if I have an electron that can be here and there at the same time, mm -hmm. zero, one and zero simultaneously, and I feed this quantum bit into a quantum computer as a program, let's suppose that you know, zero says do this, like add two plus two, mm -hmm. one says do that, add three plus one. So if I put this single quantum bit into the quantum computer, then just in the same way that this bit is both zero and one at the same time, the quantum computer is now doing this and that at the same time, adding two plus two and three plus mm -hmm, one mm -hmm. simultaneously in some funny quantum sense. So quantum computers can do this kind of strange quantum multitasking that classical computers can't. And this, it's this ability to do multiple things at once, not just two, but four or eight mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or a thousand or a gazillion, this is another technical term mm -hmm. by the way, to do a gazillion things at once that allows them to solve problems that you can't solve on a classical computer. Ah. So even a very small quantum computer with only say a hundred quantum bits could do some things that classical computers could never ever do. And just at a time when we need that kind of capacity, I suppose, but given the kinds of data and amount of data that we deal with today, is there an advantage in terms of, say, security in addition to what it can handle? Uh, yes, so, so quantum uh, mechanics has this feature. This is more quantum weirdness, but what the hey, we're talking yeah, about right. quantum <laughs> mechanics. So if I have a quantum bit, like this electron that's here and there simultaneously, yeah. And then somebody comes along and looks at it to say, hey, are you here or are you there? Yeah. Then what will happen is that the electron will spontaneously appear either to be here or to be there. No longer here and there simultaneously. Yeah, so if somebody looks at the electron, they disturb it. And then this means you can also detect to see if somebody has peaked. Uh -huh. So you can detect eavesdroppers and hackers who are looking at your quantum bits. And this means, for instance, you can make quantum computers that are effectively immune to hacking. In fact, I some see. colleagues of mine and I did the first experiment in which we built a small quantum computer and had a quantum hacker come in and show that we could pr both protect our information from the quantum hacker and right. detect the hacker's incursion to our computer. So that will be a major thing, I'm sure, right, right there. That will be a major advantage r right there. Unless you're a hacker. Well, okay, so <laughs> it, it, that means it's the end of that career. <laughs> the hacking careers are over. But that's quite interesting. The other thing is that uh, are they, they are difficult to create. You were the first person to came, come up with a viable model of a, of a quantum computer. So why is it difficult to create this and the algorithms? Uh, well, uh, the short answer is that you have to work very hard to try Evidently. to convince things like individual <laughs> electrons to do what you like. Uh -huh. you no, know, okay. they're very small. Yeah. They're very sensitive. Um, uh, it's hard to get them to do what you want them to I do. See. You have to ask them very, very nicely, <laughs> and they still may not do what you ask, no matter how I nicely see. you do. I see. So, but if you if you massage these electrons in just the right way, ask them extremely nicely, learn how to speak their language, and to try to convince them to compute, then you can get them to compute. But it has been a slow road. So. 
So back in 1993, I proposed how you could build a quantum computer. Um, Ignacio Sirac and Peter Zoller in Austria proposed a different design at roughly the same time. And my colleagues and I and many other people throughout the world have been working for the last two decades yeah. to build quantum computers. And we actually have succeeding first in building very simple ones with just a couple of quantum bits, and then ones with five or 10 quantum bits. We're now working on ones with 20 to 50 quantum bits, and we hope that in the near future we'll have quantum computers, say, with 100 to 1,000 quantum bits. And of course, you know, compared to your smartphone, this is an eensy weensy number of bits. But because quantum computers have this capacity to do so many things simultaneously, right. then even a small quantum computer with a few hundred quantum bits could do things that no classical computer could do. Okay, so if this becomes a standard, then you need a lot less to replace the digital computers that we have so much power now, that have so much power now. Is that the idea? You need a lot less from the quantum side to replace this. Well, we're not aiming to replace digital computers. Uh, okay. First of all, we don't want to make enemies about the people who make them. And also, it's not the case that everything that an ordinary digital computer can do can be replaced by a quantum computer. Ah. I mean, uh, you know, we don't want to replace Minecraft with purely quantum Minecraft, though okay. actually there are people writing programs for quantum Minecraft already. But Minecraft is already perfectly fine. It's not clear that a word processing program uh, such as Microsoft Word, right. that you need to have a quantum computer to okay. do that. Um, but there are some problems, particularly problems, for example, in uh, finding patterns in very large amounts of data where quantum right. computers could potentially provide an advantage over the most powerful classical computers. And there are quite a few fields today. Astronomy is one of them, of course, uh, but just many fields where you have enormous amounts of data and you have to make these decisions about what you're going to pick for data and throw stuff out. And in this case, you, that is very powerful if you could have a quantum computer doing it. Is that the it? So Let's that's say one. potentially very potentially. powerful. Are, <laughs> could you tell us what areas are particularly of, of interest for a quantum computer? What, what would they benefit? Where would you use them? Well, for data analysis and yeah, analyzing okay. big data and quantum machine learning, there are a whole variety of different problems okay. where quantum computers might be quite helpful. Uh, uh, just the last couple of days, my colleagues and I have been talking about the quantum Netflix algorithm. So, you know, if you have a company such as Netflix or any other such company that, that wants to take your ratings of a few movies and then provide you with a set of movies that they think would mm -hmm, be a mm -hmm, good set mm -hmm. of movies for you, then uh, it turns out that doing this in a quantum mechanical fashion uh, would be much more powerful. You could, you, you could use many more, you could analyze the data from many, many more users. You would have many more movies and you would have a more subtle analysis of how to present recommendations to people. Actually, ironically, while, while uh, uh, looking around this, as I found out that Netflix, when they were developing their own algorithm, actually called it a quantum algorithm. Oh, how about that? Yeah, because <laughs> they, they were dividing the, 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 up the I, movies and the description yeah. of movies into their individual quanta or chunks. But ours is more quantum. Of course, ours of is course. really I, I, quantum. I accept that. <laughs> Theirs is metaphorically quantum. But especially <laughs> things like big data where you have limitations now, that would be a, a, a very good area. Da yes, other things like, like image processing and pattern recognition. Ah, yes, I see. So uh, uh, there are a, a, a bunch of very standard uh, classical algorithms for doing image processing. They're very sophisticated and they do a pretty good job. Um, <clears throat> but if you take these classical algorithms and you quantize them, you suddenly have uh, an algorithm where you could run it much more powerfully on a quantum computer and analyze much larger data sets. I mean, to get a sense of this, um, you know, if I had a quantum computer with 300 quantum bits, yeah. which is the kind of quantum computer we're envisioning building in the next five to 10 years. So uh, 300 quantum bits could, could deal with two to the 300 power mm. pieces of data. And 
I mean, this is a large number, and I pick it because 2 to the 300 happens to be the number of elementary particles in the universe. Ah, all so told. To have, the all total. told. <laughs> all told. There are 2 to the 300 yeah. of them. And, and uh, so in order to have a classical computer that could handle that same amount of data, the classical computer would have to be the size of the universe itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we're a little far away from actually getting classical computers that size. I hope. No. <laughs> that would be a little bit scary. At least yeah. ones that run Windows. <laughs> yes, no. I understand. Now, another thing you also have developed, and you're the first one out the gate on this, on the idea that the universe is actually a quantum computer, and you happen to have have a book that you uh, wrote for the general public, for general readers on the subject. So why is the universe a quantum computer? So Yvonne, I, I came to this idea because I was looking at ways of building quantum computers. Mm -hmm. So what kinds of pieces, electrons, atoms, mm -hmm, photons, mm -hmm, particles mm -hmm. of light, um, what kind of pieces you, could you put together um, to actually construct a computer that would process information in this funky quantum mechanical mm -hmm. fashion. And I came to the realization that <clears throat> pretty much anything would do, because at bottom, everything is quantum mechanical. All quantum mechanical things, atoms, molecules, photons, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. store information. So for instance, a photon that's polarized like this, so its little electric fields mm -hmm, are wiggling mm -hmm, back mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. forth, you could call that zero. Photon polarized like this, you could call it one. Or an electron spinning around mm -hmm. like that, you mm -hmm. could call that zero electron spinning right, around like I that, see. you could call it one. Um, so, so I realized that <clears throat> not only could we take almost anything and make it compute, and I think I actually said at the time that you know you could make a cup of coffee compute for you if you shined light on it in the right mm -hmm. way. Right. <laughs> that would be clever, yes. Yeah, it would be useful. Actually, a friend of mine, Neil Gershenfeld, at, at uh, MIT then took up this challenge and tried to make a caffeine <laughs> molecule MIT, compute. Right. Well, you know, it's like, okay, you say you can like make coffee compute. Here, I'm going to take this molecule of caffeine yeah, and have it perform right, a quantum right. computation. So, um, but I realized that what was going on, why could we actually may have almost anything compute if we you know, massaged it in the right way right. and convinced it to work uh, to process information in the way we asked it to. Well, it's because these things, elementary particles, atoms, and molecules, were already computing. Mm -hmm. They're already registering information. You know, every atom carries with it bits of information. Every time two atoms bounce mm -hmm, off of mm -hmm. each other in the air in this room, that information is transformed and processed. And so they are already processing information. The pieces of the universe are processing information at the most microscopic level. Mm -hmm. So when we actually, um, you know, tickle them with lasers or microwaves to make them do a quantum computation to, you know, solve some hard problem, what we're doing is not just taking something that was not computing and making it compute. Instead, we're taking something that was computing all along and kind of hacking into its program I see. to convince it to compute something different from what it was doing. So I came to this realization that you know, everything is computing from trying to build these quantum computers. But then, of course, you know, once you realize that, then you ask, well, what is going on in the universe as a whole? Yeah. All of its pieces are processing information. Um, it's processing information in a way that allows what's called universal computation, which is the kind of thing yeah. that you know, ordinary computers and smartphones and human beings do all the time. So the universe is a computer. From, not from a, a metaphorical perspective, but from the actual technical definition of a computer. Moreover, because at bottom it's quantum mechanical and this most microscopic information processing is taking place at this quantum mechanical level where everything is completely weird and things are in several right, places right, at right. once, then it's actually a quantum computer. And again, I emphasize this is not a metaphor about the universe, like the universe yeah, is yeah. like a computer or like a quantum computer. It is actually a quantum computer that's processing information everywhere and doing it in a way that's universal. And we can understand a lot about the universe by accepting this realization. I want to ask you how, what we can uh, understand about the universe with this, but two things. First of all, 
everybody has asked you this, I am sure, but we have had models of the universe. It's a clock, it's a this, it's a digital computer, and now it's a quantum <laughs> computer. Fine, fine. So there is, there is that. And another very important point that you make in your book is that, the, that information is physical. And I think even you mentioned we're not used to thinking that information is something physical, but it makes sense as you explain this. Could you take up those two things, though? Of course. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, of course I'm guilty of, you know, being a prisoner of the zeitgeist, yes. right? <laughs> As are we all. Yes. Show me someone who right, is not. Right. Um, uh, yes, you know, in the, in the um, 16th century, right. uh, Galileo uh, not only invented the pendulum clock, but started to talk about right. the mechanics of the way the world worked right. in terms of things like clockwork, which became a very common metaphor mm -hmm. in the 17th century in the early 1600s. And, um, um, and uh, of course he was, you know, had a particular model for how things worked and he was applying this mechanical system as a metaphor mm -hmm. for this mm -hmm. other mechanical mm -hmm. system. Um, uh, what's interesting about that is that in some sense he's right, that is that you know, he, Galileo used this notion of trying to understand, for instance, how pendulums swing back and forth in a regular fashion, which to first extent is independent of how far they're swinging, to develop the laws of motions, mm -hmm. which were the precursors to Newton's laws of motion. So he was in some sense the first modern physicist. Mm -hmm. And he was discovering these mechanical laws for how the universe was working by thinking at the same time about clocks and right, right. the universe itself. So, of course, a, a computer is itself a mechanical mm -hmm. object. Um, and, you know, when it's processing information, physical things are happening inside them. In fact, it has a very precise clock that, mm -hmm, in fact, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that monitors how things move back and forth. And so when, uh, I guess I would, uh, I don't take umbrage, but I, I would say, yes, indeed, you know, I'm guilty of saying, hey, we are building quantum computers, so the universe is a quantum computer. Oh. But in some sense, I mean, Galileo was also right saying that the universe is essentially a clock. It's mm -hmm. a mechanical mm -hmm. system that's performing <laughs> certain functions in a regular fashion. So that's true. And it's also true that the universe is a quantum mechanical system that's processing information in a systematic way. So. Again, it's actually simply true that the universe is performing quantum computation at mm -hmm, bottom. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. a, a mathematical and physical truth. So, of course, you can regard it as a metaphor and criticize me all you like for no, that. No, it wasn't a criticism at all. I didn't take it that way in, in the book, not at all. Uh, the, the, uh, but that it operates, when you say that it operates as a quantum computer, the only uh, question at least for me was, well, in computers, somebody's feeding the information to them. So the, the, the information may, is always physical or whatever. That's, as I say, that's a different thing, a different way of looking at information than we usually have. But you're feeding, you're telling, you're giving the computer the commands, you're setting it up. But this is different. So if it operates as a computer, then where does that take us in terms of the universe? How, it, how does it work if it's a quantum computer? So that's very interesting, Yvonne. Yeah, um, so this phrase, information is physical, yeah. was the slogan of Rolf Landauer, yeah. who was a famous physicist at IBM, who was one of my mentors. Um, and uh, um, like any slogan, it can be taken in several different ways. I see. <laughs> so, um, uh, one way of interpreting it is to say, whenever we register information by having letters on a page or yeah. pixels on a screen or sound that's moving across the, through the air from uh, my mouth to your ears or neural signals that right. are being processed right. in the brain, that information is always represented by the state of some physical mm -hmm. system. You know, if I raise my voice from down here to up here. Yeah. You know, I'm changing the frequency right, of the waves right. that are going through the air. So that information is conveyed by the actual physical difference right. of the system that's conveying this information. Um, <coughs> and um, 
so whenever we actually possess information in our world, it's always represented in a physical way. Yeah. And I think also uh, Rolf meant it in also in a kind of broader sense that that even when one talks about more sophisticated forms of information processing, uh, such as you know what computers are doing when you're playing Grand Theft Auto, or uh, you know, what's going on in our brain as we're processing language, which is a more complicated form of information processing, that that too is still physical, though we may think of it in a kind of an abstract fashion. Right, okay. And does it buy us anything to have the universe set as a quantum computer in terms of what the universe is or does, where it's going, how it started. Does it tell us anything about that? Well, of course, it has already bought us the ability to build quantum computers, oh, which well, I, 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 I care have... about that. <laughs> okay, all right, we'll let that go. Maybe then. other right. people. Do. Right. Um, well, there is one um, very important feature about the universe, which human beings have wondered about for thousands of years. Um, that this, this fact that the universe is computing explains. And that is, why is the universe complex? Yes, okay. So this is quite bizarre at some level. It's almost gotten more bizarre as time has gone on because it's become clear over the last few hundred years that the universe is at bottom is governed by extremely simple laws. Yeah. You know, you can write them out a on a T-shirt. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. A few things. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and moreover, the initial state of the universe right before the Big Bang was also extremely simple. So you have a very simple initial state for the universe mm -hmm. with almost no information. Mm -hmm. a few and particles. very simple laws that have, you know, on the T-shirt, they mm -hmm. have almost very little information. So how can you possibly, from this simplicity, come to the complexity of of living systems, yeah. of human societies, of the arrangements of stars and planets and galaxies in the universe. Everywhere you look, things are stunningly complex. And the fact that the universe is, in fact, a computer explains this. Uh -huh. um, and this comes from a, uh, again, this is not a, a metaphor. Um, it comes from a branch of um, of mathematics called algorithmic information theory, which is okay. how to talk about information in terms of computation. And one of the results from this theory, this mathematical theory says, suppose you have something like the universe, which is capable of computation, but hasn't yet done anything incredibly complex. Mm -hmm. um, and suppose you start you know, programming it here and there at random. Now, what happens is that these little random seeds are like little random programs that are instructing this part oh, of the universe okay. to do something, and something that looks kind of random, instructing this part of the universe to do something else that's kind of random. But because there are very complicated things that have rather simple programs that can generate them, what this says is that the fact that the universe is capable of computation and that it's being programmed here and there at random means that if you go somewhere far enough out there, you're going to find any complicated thing that you can imagine existing in the universe. And moreover, these complex things will sh come into existence with quite high probability. Uh -huh. So, so this, this fact that the universe is at bottom computing yeah. and actually being programmed by weird little quantum random right, fluctuations, right, right, which are right. what are out there programming the universe, that explains why the universe is complex. Such a universe that is capable of computation must necessarily generate all forms of complexity, including things as complex as human life. So you're saying it could not possibly have been static from the get-go. I mean, it's, it's a given to become complex. As long as it's capable of computation, right. then it will compute. So even if you try to make it very simple, right. the existence of these little tiny so-called yeah, quantum fl fluctuations, fluctuations that program the universe are going to make it compute, and it's going to generate this complexity that we see around us. Okay, that's very interesting, and one of the most interesting forms of complexity is life. And you so wandered, we think, right? Yeah, <laughs> right, right. But you uh, wandered into this, I think, by accident. Quantum biology, did you not? That you were at first 
amused that anybody would come up with this idea that was in photosynthesis. The, uh, quantum biology has been laughed at quite a bit anyway, but they keep finding very interesting things. And then, as it, I think, as it turned out, you came up with one of the real insights on this. How did you get into quantum biology? Uh, well, uh, Yvonne, it was kind of funny. Uh, what happened, so uh, uh, in 2007, there was a paper from a very well-respected group, the Fleming Group, from Graham Fleming in Berkeley, it was an experimental paper in which they were basically taking a piece of the photosynthetic system inside green sulfur bacteria, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. zapping it with lasers and seeing what happened. And what happened was that they got very strong evidence that this kind of quantum weirdness of things being in two places at once was at play in this very fundamental photosynthetic system. Because these green sulfur bacteria are everywhere, yes. believe me. <laughs> and, and so uh, in their paper, as kind of a throwaway remark, they said, oh, well, maybe this bacterium is, a sec is essentially performing a quantum computation. Mm -hmm. And this was reported in the New York Times. So I read this in the New York Times and a bunch of my colleagues read it and we had our weekly theory group meeting and everybody thought this was the craziest thing they had ever heard. Uh, but, but, you know, they figured somebody ought to look at it so they delegated me to go look at it. <laughs> and luckily at that same meeting was um, my colleague from Harvard, Alan Osper Guzik, who's a professor of chemistry at Harvard, and he knew a lot about this, this material and the experiments that were behind um, uh, this, this claim. And so we put together our heads and we looked at the claim. And by the way, it turned out that the kind of quantum computation they were claiming this green sulfur bacteria was performing, it wasn't doing. Ah. Because they were claiming that essentially, well, I mean, photosynthesis works, you get a mm -hmm, photon, mm -hmm, particle mm -hmm, of mm -hmm, light, mm -hmm. comes in from the sun. Mm -hmm. It hits, it, let's say, a green leaf or mm -hmm, a green mm -hmm, bacterium. Mm -hmm. It gets absorbed by a chlorophyll molecule, mm -hmm. um, which is called a chromophore, which is Greek for carrying color. Right? So chromophore molecules are things that carry color. And they carry color because they interact strongly mm -hmm. with light. So it gets absorbed by this chlorophyll molecule in a leaf. It creates what's called an exciton, which is a particle of energy, a kind of bound electron hole mm -hmm. pair, mm -hmm. if you want to know. But it's a little particle of energy. And the particle of energy hops from chromophore to chromophore mm -hmm. molecule within the leaf until it gets to a place where it, its energy can be turned into chemical energy. Mm -hmm. This is called the reaction center, where mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. energy in the exciton is turned into chemical energy. And it had been known for quite a long time that this process was very efficient, mm -hmm. almost 100% mm -hmm. efficient. Once the light is absorbed, this exciton, this particle of energy, finds this reaction center and, can be, and is turned into energy with almost 100% efficiency. Um, and nobody had a good explanation for this. Uh, so, so in this paper, they said, well, maybe the exciton is doing a particular kind of quantum computation called a quantum search to look for this reaction center and find it. And Alan Asper Guzik and I were able to show right away that this wasn't doing a quantum search, but instead it was doing another kind of quantum process called a quantum walk. Now, a quantum walk is a, a quantum version of the classical random walk where, you know, if you had too much yeah. to drink, you know, you wander randomly over. wander yeah, around yeah, and you yeah. diffuse through this process. So if this exciton were performing a random walk through this process, it would just be through this photo complex, it would just be, you know, jiggling around and eventually hits upon the, the reaction center by accident. In a quantum walk, because quantum particles, uh, such as electrons or exitons, can be two or three or four or more places at once, what happens is that rather than just taking one path mm -hmm. through this photo complex, the exciton takes all paths at, at all once. The time. And the efficiency of the electron of the exciton's motion through this photo complex can only be explained by looking at the fact that it's taking these multiple paths at once Sign in some weird quantum way that nobody uh, understands. Okay. All right. So that is without question at this point. Is that true? That uh, that in photosynthesis, whether it's in plant or cyanobacteria, it would it operates in this way that it is simultaneous, and that simultaneous is the sort of quantum. Yes, absolutely. Aspect. So it's been demonstrated many times that there are 
are places in these photocomplex complex where the exciton is in this chromophore and that chromophore okay, simultaneously. Okay, so that's okay. Not I mean, there, there are arguments, these photocomplexes are called complex for a reason. Mm -hmm. They're complex. And, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so there's lots that we don't understand about it. And there's, there's ongoing arguments um, uh, between theorists and experimentalists about the exact form in which this quantum mechanical mm -hmm. coherence mm -hmm. takes. But the fact that these uh, excitons are here and there at the same time and that this is very important for the efficiency of photosynthesis, I don't think that that's a, a, a okay. there's an argument about all, that. All right. Though some of my colleagues might want to argue. Right, but well, that's because I, they ah, like to argue. They're wrong. Right. Right. <laughs> right. No, there's still, there are a number of these things, a certain bird migration with the magnetic uh, detection, and uh, certainly in DNA, there are a whole bunch of these coming out, and, uh, a number of people have been pointing out, you know, papers are coming out left and right uh, in the last mm -hmm. few years. There's a great interest in this. There's a long way to go. However, nobody else that I know of has pointed out something that you sort of solved. Um, and that is the issue of coherence, decoherence. Could you explain this quantum state and why this is so delicate and how you solved for X? Well, so I, it, first of all, it wasn't just me. It was Alana Spiruguzic okay. and our postdoc, Mr. Mosseni, graduate all student, right. Patrick Revendros. Let's be, science <laughs> okay. is a very collaborative yes, I uh, understand. way of I working understand. together. Sorry. So I, I, I would prefer not to have you say that I solved this. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> Uh, it's too bad that I can't stand up and do this because I have an interpretive modern dance that explains Oh, I this. see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which you can find on YouTube if you okay. want. So, so the idea is the following. So if you have um, uh, something that corresponds to a wave and mm -hmm. these quantum mm -hmm. particles that have waves that, correspo that correspond to them, then the wave and the particle can propagate through a completely... Uh, regular medium like a crystal they can just propagate mm -hmm, without mm -hmm, any resistance mm -hmm, through mm -hmm, this medium. So you can think of this wave wiggling along and it's just moving along just you know completely fluidly throughout this medium. And that's of course a very efficient way from getting from point A to point B. But there's a problem which is that if the medium through which it's propagating has even a very small amount of disorder and irregularity. Like the cell? like yes like these these arrangements of these chlorophyll molecules within the cell mm -hmm. then the wave tends to get stuck mm -hmm. so it will propagate along and gradually these these rather than having nice wave fronts that you know are regularly uh, uh, moving along these little irregularities gradually subtract from this regularity and eventually the wave gets completely stuck and the particle does as well so in these photosynthetic systems uh, which do have these irregularities, uh, these excitons, the, they move along in this wave-like fashion, but then they get completely stuck. It's called localization because they're mm -hmm. stuck in some mm -hmm. local mm -hmm. spot. Um, and that's bad because if you want to get over here and you're completely stuck there, then that's not good. Um, but now an interesting thing happens, which is that these mediums have some kind of disorder just from the fact that they're, you know, not assembled perfectly. But they're also jiggling around because mm -hmm. they're at, you know, finite temperature mm -hmm. and everything's mm -hmm. wiggling around and wiggling mm -hmm. around. And what happens is that this wiggling, which is called decoherence, mm -hmm. because the wiggling tends to actually also mess up the way waves move, but the wiggling will free this stuck wave from its localized place, and the wave can then propagate ah, again. It will get stuck again, but then the wiggling will you know, free it to propagate again. And so what happens in our theory, and I, I'm trying to do this dance with my fingers. Or, yeah, or, I, I, I need, some sock, need some sock puppets here. Yeah, okay. But, <laughs> but uh, <coughs> what happens is that over short times, these particles of energy, these excitons, are taking this kind of quantum walk where they're exploring all the different places around them simultaneously in yeah. some funky quantum mechanical fashion. Then they get stuck because their waves have gotten messed up and localized. Right. But then they free, get freed by the noise and decoherence and they're free to propagate in a wave-like fashion again. 
And so the noise is good for them. The noise is good. So in fact, when we first did our calculations, we said, oh, well, this will work much better at low temperature. Uh -huh. So we modeled this system, this uh, so-called FMO complex, where these original Fleming experiments have been done. We made a very, a very, uh, a, pro uh, a model that had no free parameters. All the parameters were taken from experiment. So we were and we modeled in a quantum mechanical fashion. We we're quite confident that this was going to give us a very good picture of what's going on because we knew a lot about this, uh, this complex. And so, but we found rather strangely that in fact at low temperature where quantum coherence should play the most important Absolutely. role got stuck. It wasn't going anywhere. And it's only when in our model we raise the temperature, we found, oh, when we raise the temperature, it goes from you know very low efficiency of actually making its way to the reaction center to an almost 100% efficiency of making its way to the reaction center. And in fact, we found a, a characteristic curve which said that if we ra as we started raising the temperature, the efficiency went up and up and up and up. But then as when we raise it too far, it went down and down and down and down. I see. And, and what this means is too much decoherence is bad because you, you know, instead of having this situation where you're localized and then you get to propagate, you're localized again, you get to propagate again. So you have a very significant quantum mechanical component mm -hmm. to what's happening. Mm -hmm. Then if you get, make it too noisy, what happens is you're just like wiggling around crazy all the time and you never get anywhere. I see. Uh, this is actually called the watchdog effect. That, uh, I, oh, you there's look a at some, yeah, <laughs> okay. if you are the, It's also called the quantum Zeno paradox. I like that one. If you right. look at something too mm -hmm. closely, it won't go mm -hmm, anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so if the environment is looking at your exciton too closely, it will get stuck. Mm -hmm. And so we called this the quantum Goldilocks effect. That is that there's a just a right place. level uh, of, uh, of uh, decoherence and this interplay between you know, static disorder and dynamic mm -hmm. disorder and quantum coherence converges at this sweet spot, uh, this Goldilocks point, where you get almost 100% efficiency. And all the other photocomplexes we've looked at seem to operate, bizarrely enough, right at the sweet spot where they get the maximum right. efficiency. Right. This is in photosynthesis. Yeah. And do you anticipate something similar with these other systems, the DNA, the, the uh, eye mig and the migration aspect of migratory birds, and things like this? There are a whole pile of these uh, phenomena now where people are looking at the quantum. You'd expect the same kind of uh, dynamic. Well, I think one has to be a bit careful about these claims. Uh -huh. so, so there's indirect evidence that um, avian migration yeah. employs quantum mechanical effects. And there's also indirect evidence that um, the sense of smell yes. uh, uses point. quantum mechanical effects, that it uses quantum mechanical effects to detect the vibrational frequencies yeah. of the molecules that you're smelling. So maybe you could like, you know, have somebody smell like a rose by playing the right sound. <laughs> <laughs> I, that hasn't you happened like that yet. One, no. <laughs> You'll work on yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, and there are claims about um, about quantum coherence and, ex and, and electron transport in DNA. Yeah. But one has to be very careful about these I things understand because, that, because right. actually the 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 nice feature about the evidence in photosynthesis is that they have very direct experimental mm -hmm. evidence in which I they see. can effectively catch the exciton in the uh, act of I being see. two places I at see. once. So it may very well be that these quantum effects are playing a role in these other aspects but of life. But we don't know. Yet. We don't know for sure. Right. right. I, I mean, I'm, I'm optimistic because right. I'm always optimistic. Right. But, uh, but right. I mean, right. I'll, right. Uh, but I'll wait to see you. But a word of the caution is, is what, you, what you mean. And it's interesting that this is all opening up. It's like another whole dimension in biology now. So thank you for your input in that. In our few remaining minutes, I'd like to get your background. Tell us about how you got into this field just generally as a small child or something ah, like this. Were you a child. prodigy? Or <laughs> you have also a very interesting <laughs> academic background. But first, as a kid, did you say, gee, I want to be quantum physicist when I grow up or something <laughs> like this? <laughs> well, I was a kind of a nerdy kid, and I, I, okay. I did actually very much like math and science. I actually also did a lot of sports, which was useful when people tried to beat me up for, there uh, you are, for, for, for doing too much math and right, science. Right. Yeah. So, uh, uh, um, and indeed, I read lots of, of books about science. And yeah. when I got to um, uh, school, when I started learning about physics in school, which I guess was around when I was 11 or 12, then I was fascinated by this 
apparent simplicity of the mathematical laws governing how physics worked. It seemed amazing that you could have these very simple laws mm -hmm. that govern so much of what's going Generate on in the physical world. Generate the world, world. Yeah. That's right. At that point, I decided that I, I would be interested in going to graduate school in physics at some point and maybe becoming a physicist. Then, of course, when I went to graduate school, I found that this was all a lie. Oh. The, what's actually going on is incredibly complicated. Nobody oh. understands what's going on. I but see. it was too late. It uh. was bait and switch. I see. <laughs> I see. So, but that's, yeah, that's, I mean, being a scientist is about being confused. Of right? course. I, if you're I, not that's confused, good of you to tell the rest it's time of us to that. move on. Yeah. And if you don't have tolerance for being confused and baffled, yeah. If you can't be baffled, you, you shouldn't yeah, be a scientist, right? Because right? right. you're going to spend your whole life being baffled. So you better have some tolerance or even yeah. enjoyment of it. Yeah. But actually, the, if we're working on this particular um, set of ideas about ideas of information in quantum mechanics, right. rather ironically, this is all based on work that I did for from my master's degree, my MPhil, in history and philosophy yeah. of science at Cambridge University. Yeah, that must have been interesting. Yeah, so I mean, it's actually based on my degree in humanities. Yes, I understand. So, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and in fact, if you look at my, uh, my master's thesis, which is entitled The Spread of Ignorance, there you um, are, <laughs> <laughs> after all that work. <laughs> the spread of ignorance, then a lot of the ideas for how you uh, describe these complex systems in a quantum mechanical fashion, how you describe them in terms of information, a lot of these ideas are already there in some kind of mm -hmm. incipient and embryonic form there. And then, uh, yeah, it was kind of you to say I have an interesting academic background. Checkered is perhaps a better no, word but for it's, it. it <laughs> it's, it shows <coughs> the richness because <laughs> so many people uh, in research are really very narrow. You know that this is a problem of, in, in general today. And here's this, you know, you got this humanities aspect and it made, it reminded me of Gelman, who's famously erudite, you know? Well, so, Gelman's a much smarter guy than uh, I am. Let's be realistic well, about that. So, uh, but, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, um, well, it did I did enrich have, I, your background. I had yeah. a classical education. I yeah. studied Latin and ancient Greek, and I was always interested in literature and music. Yeah. I've done a lot of music as well as math and science, uh -huh. which I, enriches my life. Yeah. Um, uh, in actually, I think in in science in general, you can you know there's always a danger if you work on too many things of becoming just a dilettante. So you have to pick and choose. I mean, I actually. Uh, when I started, when I did this MPhil, which was 1983 to 84, um, that's what convinced me that I actually did want to go to graduate school because mm -hmm. I had such a, a good time doing it under the, supervision, under, under the supervision of Jeremy Butterfield, who's now the head of the philosophy department at Cambridge. And uh, uh, it was great, and I just enjoyed playing around with the ideas. And then when I went to graduate school to do a PhD in physics, turned out that you know, I had this conception that, oh, you, being graduate students, you come up with novel and interesting ideas that you think are interesting, and then you work them out, and then everything is okay. Well, that turned out to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> because, in fact, at, at that time in the mid-'80s, these ideas about working on ideas about information and quantum mechanics on foundations of quantum mechanics, that was a very unpopular. Uh -huh. When I got to Rockefeller University to start my PhD, the first day I was talking with the head of the department, Nick Furry, and he said, well, what are you interested in working on? I said, well, I, I, I'm interested in ideas about information and foundations of quantum mechanics. And he said, ha, huh, foundations of quantum mechanics, that's only for crackpots and Nobel oh, laureates see. who've gone soft in the oh, head. <laughs> and that was very encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. And indeed, so I persisted on working on them. And then actually, after two years, they said, the three professors came in my office and said, OK, Lloyd, we don't know, we don't understand what you're working on. And we don't care. So if you want to keep working on it, you can leave. That oh. was to say they were kicking me out. And if you, if you wish to stay, you can work on these two very technical quantum field theory problems, which we're going to assign you. So that was a, uh, it was a bad experience. Right. <clears throat> Isn't that interesting, though? But you had mentioned, and I'm sorry that we're almost out of time, because that's, your story is so fascinating and instructive for many young people who are starting out 
in what something is not popular at the moment. You have to persevere as you as you did. I would actually say don't be don't as be. stupid as I was. <laughs> be, I aware, be aware, be aware of how know. your ideas might be well, perceived. Well, but you <laughs> went the unconventional route and triumphed in the end. But the, the, a lot of people, especially now with huge funding cutbacks and so on, feel the pressure to conform. And so I like your message to, you know, go ahead, try it out anyway. And you had mentioned it was just kind of dismal for a while. And I wish that we had more time to talk about it. Uh, in any case, I thank you so much for talking with us and giving us all this wonderful background. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne. It's been a great pleasure. Okay.